First question, probably most important of the day. Can you and I breed and make superhumans? Because I feel like with your musculature and my stature, my my height, I feel like we could have just like superhuman children. Yeah. But what if they came out with your musculature and my height? <laughs> I mean, we'd probably just throw them away, right? Yeah, but they could be like good people, but who cares about that? It's yeah. brutal physical characteristics. They rule the world. I don't care if you're a good person. I don't care if you donate to charity or kind to your family. I want you jacked and tall. And the rest of you, I just don't care about at all. Right. I mean, ideally, he, right? Um, ideally, he would Maybe. be, we would have to take, you know, between your height at four foot 11 and my height at six foot four, um, probably right around like six foot, mm. right? Six foot, 10% body fat. What are you at? 8% body fat? I'm at, I'm at six right now, but... Um, Jesus Christ. Yeah, it feels interesting. Um, I heard a gentleman on the Chris Williamson podcast talk about that the average optimal male height for attracting females of reproductive age is around six foot three. And uh, six foot three to, I guess, six foot five. And so I don't know, man. I, six three is kind of my sh like. If I'm gonna okay. go for height, might as well be for a lot of it. So, but then I'm not tall enough because if you you know what I mean like it's got to be. I'd have to be six nine then to make up for the difference. Oh, like averages and stuff, right? Or something. I don't know. That's how that's how breeding between two males goes. Yeah, that's I think probably the most fundamental problem. We're gonna like you know square pegs and round holes type of situation. <laughs> It's not going to stop us, is it, Mike? All right. Well, we've certainly speaking... practiced a lot. It turns speaking... out neither one of us has a uterus. Sorry, I swear I'm done. You started it. <laughs> okay. Um, so speaking of bodybuilding, you're at you're you're at six percent body fat. I just saw a post. I hope it was recent, but you said you're stopping bodybuilding. Competing in bodybuilding. I'm stopping competing. for some time. Competing in bodybuilding. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why? Why is that? Um, because the demands of competition to be done well enough for it to be worthwhile um are pretty intense um they're not like super crazy but they're um just enough of them that they kind of get way too much into my work and because my work like bodybuilding ads, it doesn't pay bills it costs money uh, at the competitive uh, sphere, like this just costs money to go to competitions and to do all the stuff. And um, so right now the work environment is so good. The career situation is so good and the opportunities are so good that if I continue to perseverate in bodybuilding competition at the level at which I'm interested in competing it, it would just detract so much from the work situation. And we have a really cool thing going at RP and I'm not, so old i'm 40 i guess but uh, and i'm not so wise but i've read a few books here and there and been around a little bit and i know that good opportunities may come around quite often if they're never guaranteed and when you have a good opportunity in front of you capitalizing on it and uh really getting out of it as you reasonably can is probably smart and so the opportunity i have with the work i do at rp you know helping to make apps and helping to run the youtube and all this other stuff um doing jobs like this one actually uh that bodybuilding gets in the way to some extent of that uh, competing wise training is totally cool it's all fun i train every day anyway or more or less every day um so that is really just um at some level if i looked back five years from now and told myself a story man like i did some cool stuff in bodybuilding and i'm proud of but i missed out on xyz career accomplishments and the money that come along with it i would not be able to sleep at night and right. that's the biggest reason that I have to put bodybuilding competition aside for the time being. Yeah. So, so that's the biggest reason. Would you say that like the next biggest reason would be the demands physically? So one being, you know, your nutrition and I imagine lack of good sleep. I've heard that guys who are cutting for bodybuilding struggle with sleep, but also the doses of anabolics that you'll, you'd have to take in prep, like, are those sort of the things that weigh on you as well? 
not so much for most of those, except for the steroids one. Most of those I do anyway. Um, I diet anyway. Mm. I always know when I'm eating. I always track everything with the RP Diet Coach app. Um, the sleep's not a problem because if you take a sufficient amount of uh, pharmaceutical grade growth hormone and you don't diet so extremely that you're starving to death, death all the time, you can still get really good sleep. I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is all obviously really good sleep hygiene. That there's multiple components to that, but the higher doses of anabolics are annoying for right. a few reasons, and that is definitely part of what that equation, the cost side of bodybuilding competition, that to me doesn't make a huge trade-off amount of sense currently. Yeah. So you said annoying for certain reasons. What what are those reasons like? the fact that you have to pin all the time or what, or what? And just, so, you know, I'm on uh, sort of, I'm not off of steroids. <laughs> uh, I'm on some d dosage year round, either a replacement or somewhat higher, but, uh, so pinning is not an issue. Um, having to bring your pinning stuff when you travel, having to arrange for steroids to exist in other countries when you travel abroad is definitely annoying and something that when you're in a pre-competitive phase, uh, competitive phase, you should be doing. If you are not involved actively in competitions and it's just kind of doing it for the look and for the love and for the progress, yeah, like going on an international trip and bringing absolutely nothing with you is totally fine. Uh, so that's definitely a thing, a minor thing, but nonetheless, it adds up. The main thing for me uh, are the side effects, uh, mostly the psychological ones, uh, specifically reduction in fluid intelligence and a, uh, a, a increase in two other qualities that come to mind. Uh, one is anxiety and the other one is aggression. And none of those things are cool. They don't tell you much <laughs> about them at the Gold's Gym where the guy gives you the open trench coat, take any yeah, like I'm, you want I'm for free. Stupid. Yeah. That's actually, I think I, I texted you um, because I saw some clip where you talked about the intelligence and yeah. the brain fog and the less appreciation for beautiful things. And like, oh, yeah, that those I are things that, that part, are, yeah. <laughs> but those are things that are just incredible for, for me to hear. Like, I was, I was like, what the f like, I, I just, it's just no one talks about them, seriously. Um, and I would love to, if you could expand on like what that looks like for, like you said, fluid intelligence, what does that look like? Like, how does that manifest? Yeah. So in a few ways, one is it's difficult to hold a complex idea in your head all at once. You can see parts of it, but not the whole thing. Another one is you tend to lose your train of thought a little bit more not because you have an attention span problem, you're actually quite focused, but because um, a lot of times you get into some intrusive thoughts and those prevent much cognitive stuff from happening and, and you end up thinking about other things that are not productive use of your time. Another one is similar to the holding things in your head at the same time is your ability to have a good short-term memory enough to say, for example, if I tell you, okay, so three things going on in my life right now. And by the time I get done talking about thing one, I know thing two, but I forgot what thing three was, or I know that I was talking about thing one and that was a great conversation. But now I'm like, so, okay, like, um, what was I saying? And you're like, thing two and thing three. And I'm like, oh, that's right. And I, maybe you still remember thing two, but thing three, I just straight up don't remember. And so, you know, it's kind of not, such a great thing uh, to be able to go through. Um, there's also a pretty decent impairment in creativity. Generally, when I'm like showering or masturbating or showering or masturbating, I'm really describing my morning routine, which is 18 hours long. Um, I have some ideas. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, but you're one of those guys that can fit 18 hours and three hours. Have you seen those guys? Oh yeah, CEO mentality, man. Yeah. So you, <laughs> you're you either a trillionaire or I do not want to know your first or last name. That's my approach <laughs> to life. So trillionaire mindset. I want to be the person that coined trillionaire mindset. Billionaire is cool, man, but it's really gets old. Yeah. Um, so when I'm thinking, I have various ideas about things falling asleep, so on and so forth. And ideas, creativity is 
pretty well misunderstood by a lot of people. Creativity is not something that typically tends to occur actively, in my experience. It's like a self-prompting GPT or Claude 3.5. It just bubbles up ideas in your head. You don't come up with these ideas. They just bubble up. It's your next thought and your next thought and your next thought. And you have some control over them, but a lot of it's just totally subconscious and it just comes out of the ether. And so the bubble thoughts, they don't come in nearly as much with good ideas. Wow. They come in either less, so you're honestly just not thinking as much, or they come in with very often they're running more on the script of how it would feel to be 10 to 20 times more male than you currently are. Because if you take 10 to 20 times the serum androgen concentration you're supposed to have and exist like that, then you're, ha- you're going to have a lot of thoughts that are extremely hyper-masculine. And one of those is dominant hierarchy thinking. For example, oh, that one Instagram comment, like that guy has no idea how much better I am at everything that I've ever done than the thing he does best in this world. That guy, what a that guy. And you just perseverate on like some guy, you don't even know his real name. Yeah, you want to kill him. Like, let's be real, Mike. That's where this was headed. So that's right. the dominant hierarchy part. You don't right. necessarily want to kill, but also there's the aggression part. So not only do you have the dominant hierarchy situation, you also have some aggression associated with it, maybe a lot. And then you feel wronged by things that people tell you. You, you, you have this exaggerated sense of self-righteousness, um, kind of like how dare they attitude, like it's me, I'm the man, mm-hmm. everybody else. Mm-hmm. And those are the thoughts that tend to bubble up and like, you know, I'm not writing a lot of good video scripts off of shit like that. It's like, holy f***. Like, I'll be brushing my teeth and fantasizing about how to beat up childhood bullies. And I'm like, what the f*** am I doing? <laughs> and it's not like a conscious decision, but like I'm in it and it's happening to me. And I'm like, whoa, right. this is just not a really very productive or pleasant state of mind. So could you put on your sleuth cap and b- maybe be able to specify what androgens that those are and at what doses or at least some sort of ballpark. Cause I imagine, I mean, obviously if TRT is bringing your serum testosterone and, and your free testosterone, all of that up to normal or maybe slightly above normal, I imagine those intrusive thoughts, the, the aggression isn't there as much at what point, like specifically, where do you feel it? Like what drugs specifically do you think where that's happened? Cause I'm, I'm, this is so interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's all drugs. Uh, it just scales with dose and some drugs do it more than others, but all drugs do it to some extent or all steroids do all anabolic steroids, all orals, all injectables. Um, there are certain textural qualitative perceptive differences between them that, um, there are that do manifest. For example, like uh, with Tren, the, um, you do have a sex drive but uh, it's a bit m- different than normal sex drive it's a it's more perverse like uh, your per- my my personal and i've heard this from lots of people uh my personal proclivities towards fetishes skyrockets on trend wow um, yeah whereas like it just it, it, a lot of testosterone will get you real horny but it's more of a normal horny times 10 versus like a a subversive horny um one one dude it, I can't personally relate to this, uh, but I understand kind of the the grand emotional push. This guy was, it was like a forum I read like decades ago where he's, oh, I I love it my first, oh yeah, my, yeah this started my, my first trend right cycle. Here. And I just like started thinking like, I must get my nipples pierced and I got <laughs> them pierced and it was amazing. And I loved it. And I love that they're pierced and I love them. And I was like, what the f- and I never had that sort of thing hit me. God bless everyone with pierced nipples, especially the ladies with pierced nipples. What's up, ladies? JK, I'm married, but what's up? <laughs> um, but like, it's that, uh, so there are some, some people will tell you like Tren is, now Tren's just straight up more powerful, but it also right. has a bit more of other elements. Um, there, you know, uh, for this last uh, show that I did uh, last week, most of the week, I took uh, Halo, Halotustin, Fluoxymesterone, and Halo makes me um, interested in committing acts of violence, um, and not any kind of violence, 
violence with my hands to other people, not so random it, it, people, just some particular people, usually make-believe fantasy people in my head, and I just keep wanting to do it. Um, wow. Well, yeah. so, well, could you imagine something like that for jujitsu or MMA? I don't have to imagine it. I've done it. Yeah. So <laughs> All right. I was, uh, when I was a white belt, I was uh, peaking for a show with Halo, and I was rolling. A stupid idea. But uh, I passed a dude's guard, and... Um, you know, there's lots of jujitsu after you pass someone's guard. There's lots of things to do, side control, back takes, all this other thing. And uh, my first instinctual desire was to rip his rib cage open. That's what I wanted to do. And it would have felt so good. That's what my brain told me. You want this. There, um, I don't know if you remember back in, I think 2003, there was a, one of the Hulk movies came out, like The Incredible Hulk, 2003. Eric Bana was in it. Mm -hmm. And Hulk fights these like hulked out dogs, like Hulk equivalent of dogs that like, his dad shot up with super Hulk serum or whatever the f and one of the dogs, he literally claws in and rips its ribs completely open, tearing the dog. Like, that's Halo in a nutshell to me. Uh, so, yeah. so, so Bruce Banner just took a bunch of Halo testing. I mean, so like, that's all that happened. That's not wrong, wrong. You do kind of feel like the Hulk. And there's all kinds of stuff in that movie, actually, that uh, there's dialogue of how it feels to be the Hulk. He's like, I feel like uh, like um, exposed nerve. And that's not wrong. He's very Jesus. highly irritable. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Everything's a problem. You also tend to, uh, I tend to become more disagreeable, substantially more disagreeable mm. on principle. Like if someone agrees with me about something, I'm like, no, no I no, said no. it best. <laughs> and it's like, uh, I almost never verbalize these things, but it just gets really annoying to have these thoughts in your head. Yeah. I imagine, doing, mm -hmm. I, I imagine that takes up a lot of space is you fighting this constant battle of intrusive thoughts where that totally. space could be could be gpt stuff it could be bubbles coming up with ideas bubbles and, of ideas yeah yep. that just yep. don't occur yeah it's just, still it's same ideas taken up. Same, same ideas but the ideas are like man it'd be cool to like like fight a dog with just your hands and kill it like <laughs> what <laughs> why is that in my head you know uh and so yeah there's I definitely mean, that that whole situation occurs fuck. that that's got to get tiring. Just like, just, yep. it's just a chore to be awake. Just con unless yeah. you're at in war <laughs> or like, it's an interesting way you put that because, um, for many months of really hardcore steroid cycles, um, I would spend about 10, five or 10 minutes lying in bed before getting up because I didn't, I didn't want to get up. I didn't want to do anything. I was really scared of the upcoming day. Uh, the upcoming day was an, another opportunity to feel an insane burden on myself and another opportunity to risk failing at things as opposed to being excited and happy that it's another day to do the thing. And then uh, getting to bed was super nice because it was going to be quiet time for my mind. I didn't have to live with all these thoughts anymore for like eight hours or whatever so like the longer i could sleep the better it would be like super ideal to sleep all of prep completely away <laughs> uh that's definitely a thing yeah man i i'm this is just so amazing to me because like i've been in the fitness industry for uh over a decade now started doing this stuff in 2013 and you know i'd heard a lot about on on forums and reddit about you know trend dick and mm -hmm. like psycho guy like guys that do crazy shit when they're on trend and, and stuff like that but it's always been the, the level of nuance when people talk about it, it's never really existed and and i it's nice to hear you speak of it and seriously it, it does feel refreshing to me and I, I like i think it's important i definitely think it's important because if bodybuilding requires you to do that to your brain like that it's one thing to you know football on a certain level, the requirements that it has of your brain is to take on damage fighting. Yeah. Same thing, take on damage yeah, yeah. repeatedly. And it's, that's like why it's no good, right? Because when you, when your body breaks down, when you're older, your brain is the only thing remaining. And I don't think people talk about the tax on your brain and your cognitive abilities. And just like 
having to do all of these cycles over and over again, the, I can imagine maybe PTSD might come from it and, and things like that of that nature. Like it really is like, you know, is this sport, is this way of living, is it worthwhile in the first place? Um, which is, it's just super interesting to me. I'm, I'm glad to hear you talk about it. Yeah. Well, so, you know, proper caveat in here is like, I might be an extreme case. Um, maybe most people are not as sensitive to the psychological side effects. If I told my friend and colleague, Jared Feather, what I just said to you, that maybe I'm an extreme case and maybe other people don't think this way, he would roll his eyes and he would say, you're just more introspective than most bodybuilders. Mm. They do feel this way. They just can't identify it. And they just end up slapping their girlfriends around or like throwing things across the kitchen table. Right. And that does happen all the time. Um, if you, if I'm in every one of my states, except for the very lowest of my low, if you catch me in the street, I'm going to be unreal, super kind and pleasant. I just have a really intense stare, but that's mostly just me being Russian and being related to the rest of my family. My sister has the same crazy stare that I do. Yeah. Other than that, you'll be like, oh, this guy's chill as f But you meet lots of other folks, powerlifters, bodybuilders out in the real world when they're on peak cycle, and they'll tell you, like, they'll type into an Instagram comment, like, oh, dude, this f doesn't happen to me but you meet them on cycle and they're huge dicks and you're like, it absolutely happens to you. You just think it's, that's how you should be. And here's a real fucked up part. A big part of having a lot of androgens, at least in my bloodstream is it gives you the sense of righteousness. I should be like this. It's the, it's not because of the fact that they don't have the kind of peaches I want at Kroger it's not because of the androgen level that I'm radically misperceiving the injustice that was caused to me. It's because these assholes at Kroger can't ship the right peaches to the store like, like they're supposed to. And your brain will get tricked over and over into assuming that all of the things you're thinking are the things you're supposed to be thinking. Right. So a lot of guys will be like, people just piss me off, bro. And it's like, no, 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 no. You're out of your mind. So one of the mm. things I've told so the few folks that I've been involved with who I've had the pleasure or displeasure of being there when they start their journey into anabolics is when you're on harder cycles, really anything, you have to understand that the thought bubbles you get that pop up for you, um, they're not an indicator reliably anymore of what the world really is. And so anytime you have an idea when you're on lots of gear, about, well, this person wronged me, or I should be doing this and that. Uh, just assume you're wrong first. And then after you've assumed that you're wrong, take some time, really think it through, try to get calm, and almost never act on it. So one thing that ends up happening with me is I will end up really quiet, like with my wife. And when I'm super, super quiet with my wife, it's uncharacteristic because she's talking to me and she is um, expecting me to talk back. I talk a lot. That's what I do. And she'll ask me a question and I'll just be real silent. And she knows because we've talked about this a bunch that all of my GPT thought bubbles coming up as responses are uncivilized and are not worthy of her hearing them. And so I'll sit there for her 15, 30 seconds, a minute straight until I can materialize something civilized to come out of my mouth up to and including, is it okay if we talk about this at a time when I can make a bit more sense of things? And she's almost always like, yeah, absolutely, dude, because the drugs will make you feel like, oh, I got all sorts of to say about this mm. and all of it's toxic. Right. And so one thing that I consider something that's very important to me is when, if and when I'm on higher doses of drugs, I consider it my, my duty to never lose my civility, never threaten people physically, never get into physical altercations, never raise my voice. Um, other than with my parents, I have a perfect track record of civility. Uh, you know, the parents thing's a bit different. Right. I'm not proud that I, uh, on a few occasions have yelled at my parents 
actually none of them have been on a lot of gear <laughs> just teenagehood and uh and emotions but a lot of people just don't know that and so when they're on gear it's very easy for them to to be like yeah like i'm gonna share what i think about shit and all the stuff that comes out is toxic and everyone around them is like dude you're different and they might not even tell you that because they're kind of scared of how you're going to perceive it so it, yeah it's just a, it's a weird cognitive dissonance that's like it's hard to to pin down um i like what you said about how it's not them that thinks that they're wrong it's the world that's wrong and it should be a, a certain way it's very very interesting stuff um mm -hmm. So I, I actually, I want to talk about our pal, Joel Seedman. And well, mainly, I think just kind of charlatans in the fitness industry. <laughs> okay. um, uh, because this is something that I, you know, I, I think if I was, uh, you know, a black belt in weightlifting knowledge and coaching, uh, um, I think like I'd be a purple or brown belt in speaking on charlatans. I've really mm. been talking about these guys for quite a while. And um, you and I, I think, as far as I know, are the only people to have debated Joel Seedman. Um, but I think, like, I, I would just, I just kind of like want to go over these things because it's incredibly frustrating um, to see how it plagues almost every aspect of strength and conditioning. And not just for guys who want to be big and strong and regular dudes paying their taxes, but for athletes who want to optimize performance. And one of the biggest ones is like, you know, just be being very absolute about exercise selection and range of motion and how and when you do things. And it's just so frustrating to me that it feels like we, this cycle never stops. No matter how much you say like, hey guys, um, a deadlift isn't bad for you inherently. It's the it's it's you going beyond your capacity in most things that is going to cause you to be injured. If you don't have an experience with a certain load or a certain amount of reps, like that's what causes the injury because you're going beyond your capacity. It's not the movement itself. But these charlatans, they kind of list off these exercises that they don't do. And I feel like it's because they're they have to mountain offensive. You know what I mean? Like, like they, they have to be, uh, they, they have to say, this is the line at which we've drawn. All of this is bad. All of this is good. And then from here on out, we just make fun of the bad. Shit. Instead of kind of accepting things from all different places, because that wouldn't allow them to sell things. Um, yeah, but I, I, for, for me personally, I would like to kind of talk about your, uh, debate with Joel, if you recall it whatsoever, and how that went. <laughs> I recall it to a mild extent. I think uh, there's a lot of good stuff in what you just said, man. I think people, the average human being, is pre-wired to do in-group, out-group, us versus them, right versus wrong. And it's insanely adaptive in our ancestral environment, significantly less adaptive now in a more complex but much more gentle environment in which we exist. So when you give the consumer writ large of strength and conditioning advice, nuance, yeah, it fucks, it's cool, it sounds smart, but there's something missing that real exclamation mark, that real feeling the person gets of, oh, I'm onto some shit, man, I'm onto the truth. And those other people, they're onto some just bad shit, like just wrong shit. And you see the same thing in politics, same exact driver driving that people's uh, um, interests in good versus evil, right versus wrong, us versus them. And so charlatans, I don't know if consciously or not, it's irrelevant, end up tapping into that. Mm. Um, you know, there's like uh, a lot of fake, do uh, fake, do they're all real doctors, unfortunately. Dr. Gundry, Dr. Oz, Dr. Axe, Dr. Berg. These are like internet doctors that tell you like blueberries, they'll kill you. Apples, don't eat them. Walnuts, health food will make you live forever. The extremism has that us and versus them, good yeah. versus bad mentality. And absolutism is dope in the sense that like, look, if you like one plus one equals two, it's an absolute truth. 
And isn't it wonderful that we know that? I mean, mm -hmm. the directionality of our enhanced wisdom as a society is towards everything that we know being absolute, like objectivism, the discovery of real truth. That's fucking dope. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Right. But charlatans will put it to you like they already found it, but they're just right. make believing it. And it's like you're looking to rent a Ferrari to drive around town and you don't know what a Ferrari looks like. Some guy finds out you want to rent a Ferrari. He pulls up his Toyota Corolla. He's like, bro, 50 bucks an hour. You got a Ferrari right here. And you're like, my man, you're driving around in it. It feels pretty good. This is a nice car. It's not as fast as I thought, but it's nimble. It's reliable. That's great. That wasn't a Ferrari. Someone just cut in front of you in line and said, I have this thing you're looking for. The thing you're looking for is way down at the end of the line. But I have it now. And especially this is pertinent when people get into strength and conditioning or whatever field, mm -hmm. many, many fields have charlatans in them, and they get a certain displeasure at the stochastic nature of it all, at the uncertainty. Uncertainty is troubling. Some people are better with it than others. Some people really do not enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And when someone can give you the literal psychological relief, the medicine to take away your uncertainty and replace it with, you're a good person doing the right things, and those other stupid bad people, they're doing bad things. Everything clicks to place and makes sense. And that's why we have religion. I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. But also religion. But also charlatanism. So I have a few terms um, that I kind of came up with um, as far. And what I call it is like the, the charlatan playbook. Do you I are think you might brown belt and charlatans. This is you, awesome. You, you might like this. Um, some of these terms, one of them is weaponized specificity. And, uh, I love this it. Was, I love it already. This, <laughs> yeah. This one was so frustrating to me because that's where I got my start was in strength and conditioning. Um, and it's, it's as simple as this. Uh, when is an athlete going to lay down on a bench and press? Not so why real would we sport, do man. Right. Well, yeah, right. But, but what I, what they're saying is like the, the, the idea is, Whatever exercise I do that I deem correct can be directly transferred to the court, the field, whatever, what have you. This is like, and, and mind you, this is literal day one um, uh, uh, of strength and conditioning here. It's like understanding going from general to specific yeah. and the specific, you know, imposed yeah. demands. Like yes. that, we're, we're that, is gym. Day, that is literally yeah. day one, right? We're so the gym building bigger and stronger muscles and that's about it. Everything and then else we to take can, care of somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. And then here's the thing too, cycles, macro cycles exist. Yep. So what we're doing yep. now might not be as specific as what we're going to yes. do before the season happens. Yeah. And so it's, it's incredibly weird how that argument still comes up. It still comes up. If the trainer or the coach is doing, you know, hypertrophy work one week out from game one of your football season, like, yeah, it's probably That's not ideal, right? You're you're yeah. driving adaptation when in reality they should be recovering and getting prepared for battle on Saturday or Sunday or whenever, right? That makes sense. But to 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 say that that guy making a mistake here is now responsible for all general training is absolutely bonkers the other term yeah um that you touched on is you know in group out group but i think there's it's, it's you have to in order to sell you have to mount an offense there has to be the enemy so yeah oh yeah it's, it's very helpful yeah what what i realized with like joel seedman right um his you know 90 degree training is it's i actually like i find it to be very valuable and I actually do it. I did it with my jujitsu athletes that I was training very recently. But I, I think for for jumpers, it could work very well. But guess what? I also like you know lighter, maybe higher repetition, more uh, you know whatever deep squats. Like I like those things too. Um, but he that that cannot exist for him, right? So I for me, I I don't think Joel Seedman is. What he does is bad. Um, I want to use some of that stuff, but I also want to use my stuff. They can't use anyone else's stuff. Um, yeah. 
And then, and then, like you said earlier, the sacred knowledge is what I call it. Sacred knowledge is like, mm. I am the keeper of the sacred knowledge and I will give you a bunch of jargon that you might not understand. Uh, and just come to me for kind of the translation to the normie people so that you can get it. And you now you've created yeah. this supply and demand and, and it's a great relationship to sell. Uh, but I, I was able to pin down Joel Seidman in a debate within seconds within seconds and i think you did as really? well and he just kept yeah i wasn't trying to pin him down i was trying to get himself i was trying to get him to talk himself into a corner he couldn't talk himself out of and i'm pretty sure he did because based on the reaction to that video even in the comments man people were like holy shit, this guy is off on a gangplank and there's just ocean beneath him um how did you get him how did you pin him I, I said, here is an absolute statement that you said, Joel. Um, squatting below parallel is the most injurious thing that you can do. That's yeah. it's wow. literally, <laughs> it is the, and, he, and I go, so do you, you stand by this? And he's like, look, it's going to sound crazy, but you know what? Yes, I do. And it was like, he felt the way he said it was like, oh, I'm a martyr for saying this. I, I believe in this. And no matter how much criticism I take, I believe this. Yeah. And it does make him sound strong. And I go, okay, totally understand. So you and I just disagree. And he goes, but, but I think that um, a deep body weight squat uh, is okay. Yeah, and I go, I hmm, okay. I got, now I got a little, there's a little room here that I can slide in and start. A you know what I mean? of light. Right. So then what I said was, okay, so how many reps? And then he's like, oh, I don't know. Talk, kind of talks his way out of it. I go, okay, so if you're allowed to do 20 reps at a, a, a below parallel squat with your body weight, would it be okay to do five with a five pound oh, weight in your you hands? Son of a... I love you know, that. what happens when you're 275 pounds and the other guy's 150 pounds? The load is different. Are they both allowed to do it? And it's just like, well, now because he's the absolute gatekeeper of what is allowed and what isn't allowed, yeah, he's like, oh, I, I don't really know the line anymore. And it was as easy as that. It was already over. Wow. See, you like, know? I wouldn't have tossed that one to him because I could have argued my way out of it if I had to defend his position. It's a very <laughs> yeah. easy argument. You say, well, the proportionality of danger is in alignment with the load and the proximity to failure and the number of reps you do. So if you do no load, one rep, very far from failure and a full deep squat it's not that dangerous but if you do a ton of reps with crazy load and to your limits it is maximally dangerous yeah that well isn't you're not coherent but wrong uh, right. uh, understanding of how things work so i would not have said that because the only arguments i generally say to people are ones i know i don't have a steel man of so uh, uh what i would have said to him is joel uh by the way you nailed it that was amazing my res my response to him in that context might have been like so i've looked at all of the data that's available and published so far and most of the data shows that deep knee bends are actually healthy for the knees and there's no mechanistic data and definitely no statistical data of injury rates to and no biomechanical inference for us to assume that the squat is dangerous below parallel so I love your idea about how it is. I just want to know how you came to your idea. And that's when the cookie starts to really crumble because he's like, oh, I just f made it up. Uh, mm. is it, and then he'll probably go like, well, top guys that I work with, I mean, they really experience some problems down there. And then I'd be like, oh, do you think that's maybe because they like had a prior history of knee injuries or because they're like, it's the deep squats. And he's like, well, a lot of the guys have been hurt. I do believe I was involved in a discussion with him about this so, sort of situation because he leaned he lean on that NFL player situation. Um, oh and, yeah. And so that's how to handle that. But you're God damn, God damn. And, and did he, well, so, what was his response? Did he feel, did he walk away with his, cause I know he had a response, but did he walk I, away I, feeling undefeated? Like he typically does, or did he, did, could did, did you shake him? I think, I think I was much more willing to be like, Oh, then we just disagree. Like at sure. any turn, I was just like, Oh, then we just disagree. Then we yeah, disagree. that's the best like, way to do it. Cause I'm not the viewer to... decides. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, your, you, you said, um, if I was him, I would have said this. And then what you said was there's a variable, which is load and, 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 or reps, right. Yep. Failure, and, proximity, see, load and reps. Yeah. Right. 
But that's not absolute. That's enough, not. Though. But that's it's yeah. Not that's not at all. Yeah. That, that'd be like me saying, "Hey, if Joel Seidman wasn't Joel Seidman, he'd be Joel Seidman." You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it it can't exist in the same place. And yeah, that that was another thing that um that I got with him was like you know load and like so much of being a coach is understanding like like what you're looking for as far as as speed and safety and how tired the athlete is and that's how you uh change programs and movements but to set out from the get-go and say no matter what this is what it is it's it's actually crazy you, because like now you're oh, just yeah. making it hard for yourself like why you know <sighs> but like, to your point and I'm only piecing this together now because of your kind of uh, the landscape you've sort of observed about how these people behave themselves. To your point, if they didn't constrain themselves to very absolute absurdities, that's their brand. If mm -hmm. they're talking about nuance and it's all based on what the athlete needs, they ain't selling anything anymore because nuance is like, uh, I don't know, ugh, what am I even buying? Yeah. But if I can get a sense of, when I watch Joel Seaman videos, these movements are brilliant and there's a logic behind them. I'm not exactly sure what that logic is, but a few elements of it stood out to me. For example, most people have an intuitive and largely incorrect understanding that extreme ranges of motion are probabilistically more injurious than not extreme ranges of motion. So he's going to prey on that. And so when someone tells you like him, don't squat deep, you kind of have this like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's like, that's like someone telling you not to drive your car really fast. It's dangerous. We do that. that makes sense. That makes sense. A real quick story for you, uh, Zach, you might appreciate this. Mr. Nick Shaw, the CEO of RP, him and I were uh, training at a, um, a university gym together literally like 20 years ago. And Nick was doing f uh, deep knee bends, as you weightlifting fellas call them, full squats. We only like at the time and, and since we only squat high bar like all the way. And so Nick did a set of 10 with whatever, 300 pounds, racked it, walked out of the rack. And a dude literally was like, hey, man, are you like worried about like like knee injuries and stuff with squatting? And Nick gives him the only response that just goes right to the heart of the matter. He goes, oh, yeah, like, uh, so why would it? And the guy literally responds. It is This is going to be video and audio. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. The guy literally responds by making a, a V shape with his fingers okay, to, to replicate a knee. Yep. This is the knee yep. anatomy, see? And his Very only good. response to Nick was nonverbal. And he goes, because like, and he moves his hands. And Nick was like, go on. And the guy's like, I got nothing. He just knew that when the knee did the thing that it does, the bendy thing, isn't this bad? And I think he, he wanted Nick to fill in the rest, but there was no the rest to fill in. He just felt like when you go deep, something bad happens. You couldn't articulate it, but so he just Joel felt like it. Oh, yeah. Joel, Joel has the rest. It's not correct, but he has yeah. the rest. That's why he's so sure. successful. See, yes. He's been able to build the rest yes. and by utilizing jargon. Yes. So it's just, and so confusing jargon that I have the rest. Don't Eccentric, worry about it. Isometrics. <laughs> yes. Whatever that Which means. <laughs> down and hold. Like, I don't, yeah. yeah. So yeah, sure. that's, that's the thing. And um, yeah, the, he brought up some crazy study that I had never heard of. And I called him out on it. I was like, I would die to see this study. So mm. there was a study that said, it, like powerlifting and or weightlifting was actually one of the least injurious sports or it was like uh it was actually quite safe these two sports there, there are a few studies that say that oh yeah right and he was like no they went back in and they opened it back up and they realized that they were wrong initially and they actually found that it's one of the most injurious sports or something like that and, and he's like there was a study i'm like i couldn't i have no idea but what he ended up explaining to me was almost exactly my point was he was like, look, I developed this because I've seen a lot of guys squat low, heavy and injure themselves. And I go, you, you, you gave me a variable. You just gave me a variable. You, the, if people are squatting too heavy, yeah, that is exceeding their capacity, yeah. which Joel, Guess what? I agree with you. Yeah, don't exceed your capacity and yeah, don't don't exceed your capacity. But that's not what you said. And he just right. couldn't. It would just we'd go back and forth. 
we'd go back and forth and back and forth. And he would then agree with me. And then I'd be like, Hey, but you're not disagreeing with yourself. And then you'd go back, you know? And it was like, yeah, okay, well, his, to me, his air and debate seems to be one of just trying to buddy buddy with you and yep. get on the same page and like everything's good and it's slick i'll give him that but it especially infuriating because uh, what i want him to understand is that no you're a person who makes things up and makes money off of make-believe and there this is not a conversation in which we're going to be friends afterwards because you're a f liar and this is going to be a painful conversation for you so it's one of those like you two wrestlers about to shake hands on the mat and the other one just goes i'm good man i'm good we're not tapping fist before a ufc mm -hmm. fight mm -hmm. and, but if you come at it with that intensity i had a debate back in the day on omar isuf's channel with greg Doucette, who is a two-faced lying sociopath sucker <laughs> print that and he talked magic in his videos with his fake voice about how fucking stupid I was and how wrong I was about volume or whatever the fuck it was about. And I was like, oh, this guy wants a shot at the title. So when we got face to face in a debate, I mirrored that energy. And he turned off his parrot voice and went straight into nice guy agreeable mode. And almost all the comments were like, oh my God, this Mike guy's a fucking asshole. And then this Greg guy just came to the conversation to try to learn. No, he didn't. He's trying to learn. Shit. He's like, just totally two faced, but that fake nice guy act that like, oh yeah, and no, I'm just here to learn. And I totally hear you is, I don't know if it's fake for Joel Seedman or if he's really that stupid, but, um, it, it really is. It's, it's like a, a it's great interesting, tactic. great tactic. And great so what tactic. I like to do, I, mean, I, I, yeah. I, right. I altered my approach with Joel Seedman, the Greg Doucette thing. I was like, oh God damn it. Like I fell hook, line and sinker for that. Shit. Uh, with Joel Seedman. I was just doing the Socratic method where I was right. like, explain Same. to me what your thing is that you think. And he would. And I go, okay, so some folks say that this part that you explained doesn't make any sense. Can you explain that because of these studies and the way I think about things? And he would just stutter and stumble and try to be like, well, I'm saying what you're saying. I was like, what's well, that exactly what I'm saying? Or to come back around, just like with you, you come back around and he tries to fiddle and he come back around, tries back to fiddle. And, and then he looks like a doofus he's, he looks nice like a nice guy but he looks like like people are like i don't even think he stands for anything at this point like when you have it acceded all of your points away and you've basically said like well I, yeah look totally i totally see it from your perspective and when you're like not defending your positions anymore you clearly fucked up but at yeah. least you don't seem mean about it and so i think a lot of people that really works well on because they won't do the Socratic method. They'll get in there to try to be attack dogs. He'll be super nice and conciliatory. He'll say a couple of things that sound smart. You won't have all of the time and throughput to, to refute all of them. And then a lot of people walk away from that and be like, I don't know, man, this Joel, Joel, Joel guy seems like a nice guy, which is really funny that people even do that because it's one of those things where like, you know, the, one of those revelations of how debate works is you're not debating the other person. You're debating to a crowd. And unfortunately, the thing with crowds is that a lot of people do not do the uh, analysis of the actual structure of the debate to see who's right. more correct. They just see who gets the, who has the best vibes. Yeah, like, I don't know if that Dr. Mike guy's smart or whatever, but he's kind of a cocksucker. Like, yes, this is not a discussion of who's a cocksucker or not. If you're the worst person in the world, you get Adolf Hitler, you give him a script for like the revealed truth of quantum mechanics, and you give the Mother Teresa a script that a child wrote about how quantum mechanics is stupid. Hitler's right. I'm sorry, Hitler's bad, but he's fucking right. Most people don't, I was going to say, think like that. They don't feel like that. So when nice guy charlatan shows up, a lot of people fall hook, line, and sinker again. Like that guy right. seemed really nice. Like we are not, he could listen, real talk. I simply do not know who Joel Seedman is in real life. Zach, he could be a totally decent guy that just straight up believes his own shit. He's just not that smart. He he has some ideas that he saw people get injured and he kind of had these ideas and he's a little bit egotistical like all of us. He's kind of attached to them and he may, may be considered altering his, his ideas, but he really feels like the right, maybe he's just a nice guy. We don't know that. It's cool. unlikely, but maybe he's just a nice guy. And then he comes off as a nice guy. You come off as an asshole. And he, in a sense, sort of wins that debate because he was a nice guy. Well, I didn't know about this uh, Greg Doucette thing. So mm. there, there was history before the debate? 
Yeah, he made like at least one video, maybe two videos uh, out of the ether talking about my like volume recommendations because I think I was featured on Jeff Nippert's channel and he was busy attacking Jeff Nippert all the time because the way Greg operates uh, explicitly, and I do have text message confirmation of this, is he generally only punches up or down, but not really far down. Not because he's a conciliatory person, but because of clout. He needs you to be a big deal in social media for him to actually, first of all, debate you at all, or second of all, talk shit about you. So he started the shit talking and the debate happened because I was like, oh, he's talking shit. Let's fucking do the goddamn thing. I love face-to-face -face debate. Turns out Greg, not a big fan of them and made pretty close to zero sense in the debate, but he seemed like he was there to learn and listen. I seemed very and was very aggressive. I wanted to embarrass him intellectually because he's a moron and he's wrong a lot. And he came at me with it. I would have had a just attack random people on the internet for sharing their kind thoughts. Oh my fucking God, who the fuck would I ever do that for? He came at me first and I, and I fucking came at him hard, but n almost no one. There were like 5% of comments were like, get him, Mike, that stupid video he made. And other people be like, what video? Most people, that was the first video they saw. Yeah. They saw Greg coming in as a nice guy. They saw me coming in as an asshole. And that's all they ever needed to hear. And I still see things uh, every now and again, in like YouTube comments, people are like, yeah, the Greg guy seems kind of weird. He does seem like a genuine guy. He may be the least genuine person I've ever had the displeasure of interacting with. Like, uh, that's the reality. But yeah, he played it well. And kudos. That was great. He did great. That's that's the biggest problem with social media and YouTube and all this space is no matter what, you can never understand the masses and what they've consumed. You, you totally. almost like I have made, uh, I think 70 technique videos on how many movements Two. my man, the snatch and the clean and jerk 70. There's a lot of thinking going on about those two movements by a large right. fraction of the world. <laughs> and so I'm in eight years on making YouTube on weightlifting. Mm -hmm. Do I just do the same thing again? Because I, I could. People, people comment and be like, hey, can you make a video on overhead squad or whatever? Like, I've, done, they, I've done they, five They of simply them. won't Google it. Yeah. Right. And so that, that's the thing where you had every reason to be aggressive and be factual and want to win a debate with facts and logic, mm -hmm. throwback to 2018. Uh, <laughs> Before facts destroys with yeah. dis oh, that's destroys right. with yeah yeah with facts liberal and logic. destroyed with logic oh yeah. god so, owned so, yeah to to want to win a debate intellectually should never be punished it's that's the purpose of it right but to to get emotional tie-ins is actually how you win you're debating towards the crowd so for you to do yeah. that is totally right but nobody knew that or or the massive amount of people, Most people didn't, didn't know that yeah and, and so that's an incredibly uh a valid point i think that has actually occurred to me a few times with charlatans um yeah dude were you really pissed afterwards when you realized you got fleeced basically and you were like god damn it I didn't even so, know. It, it's like you had a title fight, but you were hitting the wall for an hour, and you're like, "Oh, you you didn't show up." The guy won, and you're like, "What the fuck? I thought you guys said fight this wall." And you're like, "Nope, you fought the wrong object." We we had a there was a mediator, and the mediator is my good friend, and I, just like I imagine, Omar's your good friend. This and is with Joel this, Seedman. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, one round, and, only one debate ever. Yeah, only one. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure he doesn't want another one. If we did it again, like the same shit would be said. 100%. Like it would, it, there's nothing, there's no changing. So, um, but the, the part that kind of upset me was like, I actually have friends and, and my friend who's a mediator who are, I don't know if they bought the, the emotional aspect of it, but they, like, I was like, he is very specifically wrong about this very specific thing that I'm pointing mm -hmm. out right now. Mm -hmm. And here's what he's like, I, I couldn't draw out a map of how this process worked any better than I did. And yet they still were kind of afraid to be like, yeah, I guess you're right about that. And I was mm. like, you know what I mean? That's, yeah. that's what bothered me. I think the most. Um, and I think that kind of this sort of thing exists. It just does not stop. It's just 
so pervasive in the space. It's just crazy, dude. It's, it ends up seeming that you're, when you're a little bit, maybe not even aggressive, but very straightforward, very analytical, very interlocutorial with a debate, you're really yeah, trying right. to like really get into some just underlying ideas. You almost seem like a harasser, like an attacker. And he seems like a just guy minding his own business. And he ends up being like, well, these are just my ideas. You know, it's just what I think. And it's like, uh, that's, that's actually not true. It's not just what you think. It's what you tell people is the reality. It's not just in your head. You're spreading this on the internet and you happen to be wrong about it. You're not a passerby. You're not, a, oh God, this has nothing to do with me. You're the genesis of the problem. Now notice that sounds again, really, really confrontational and really perseverative and really incisive. And then it again paints you as the villain. But it's like, imagine, you know, it's like when Batman like beats the shit out of a mobster who like stole and did unspeakable things for years, but also like had a couple dummy charities he would crank a couple million to every couple of years. Batman looks like the bad guy. And that's kind of the thing with Batman is he would go after people and he'd look like the bad guy. Oh my God, he beat that poor man half to death. Like that man is a terrible person. But now that he's bloodied and begging for his life on a sidewalk, Batman seems evil. That's a that's a problem for Batman's PR. He didn't have to address because he would just fucking disappear into the night. But when you have, you know, you're known as Zach, the guy who knows weightlifting and the guy who gets after charlatans, some people make, oh, that guy's kind of a dick. Like, mm, yes, but he didn't start this war. They did. And they play a soft war. They make it seem like they're on your side, but they're lying to you. Oh, and maybe they don't even know they're lying but they're lying and we're here to stop it. And it doesn't look nice. It's like, if you arrive, it's like if you arrive to a police scene and this poor lady is being stapled to the ground and handcuffed and she's begging for her life. A lot of people get their phones out and go, oh my God, I'm gonna police abuse. What you, what you didn't see right before that is her like throwing a brick out of her car window at the fucking cops, screaming insane racial absurdities at the cops, trying to stab the cop and he finally gets around and puts her on the ground. If you show up late, you go, oh my God, like this cop's evil, like, but, 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 you, but you don't know who that lady is, do you? Yeah. Well, she's just a lady. Oh, is she though? She's not. But when you come in and you know who Joel Seedman is a lot of so we did our debate on Mark Bell's channel a ton of his uh commentators uh people that view and comment very different people than people just view a ton of them knew who Joel Seedman was and when you know who Joel Seedman is and you anything else about physiology or anatomy you want him to burn and they just couldn't get enough they were like Mike get this guy this is liberating this right. idiot oh my god but the people who come there for the first time they're like why is this mean man harassing this nice man who just <laughs> has a nice way of training and he trains yeah. nfl athletes as if that's some kind of grandiose accomplishment right there is and i'll we can leave it with this um there is this movie that i saw when i was younger it's an incredible movie um i think it's the the language is flemish it's in Nether is it Netherlands mm -hmm. or something or, or that would make like sense. Mm -hmm. Netherlands. Yeah. And it's this guy. He's jacked. He's huge already off to a good start. Um, good and he, as far works, as he works in this industry. Uh, it's like a, a crime syndicate kind of thing where they buy and sell livestock. And it's amazing. The symbol What a seedy business. <laughs> Yeah, and, and but it's a, it's amazing the symbolism because he's injecting this livestock with hormones to get them f jacked, and he's also injecting himself to get f huge and jacked, and he's part of this mob, whatever. And it flashes back and forth between his history as a child and his bully, his childhood bully, um, was f evil, was pure de like demented evil, and one day. They're like, he's doing his typical bully shit, beating the fuck out of him. And he just goes off and he smashes his balls with a brick, destroys his balls with a brick. The, the, who destroys whose balls? The bully. The bully does. Destroys when he's a child. The, the kid. Okay. When he, yeah. So it's a flashback, right? Holy and shit. And so now, now we understand that this guy's not just jacked because uh because he's taking steroids he's taking yeah. steroids because he has no balls left anymore but right. he's also taking steroids because he this childhood bully exists in his life right it's yeah. still in his head and it's still part of this his his work right 
the buildup to this movie is incredible. So he, he gets, uh, you know, a lot of stuff happens. It's crazy crime syndicate style movie. You know, it's a mob. Uh, it's also in Flemish. It's, it's really w- wild. He finally finds his childhood boy. Oh, boy. Yeah. It's his whole, it's, it's everything to him. It's literally everything to him. And he realizes he's in, a, he's in a hospital. So he goes and he sees him. And he looks and his childhood bully is completely brain dead. He had some sort of like horrible stroke or something. And he's completely brain dead. And he's in, he's in a, you know, he's laying down and he's just like a vegetable, totally incoherent, can't speak. None of that can, yep. can occur. Yep. And he just stands there and was you know what I mean? It's like seething his his whole world, everything he's ever known since childhood has not been real. He doesn't get an opportunity to have vengeance, but then he realizes like, is the vengeance going to even do anything? Yeah. That's like, what trip. does it mean to him to have this vengeance? And it was just, it's an incredible revelation. It's dude, this movie's cool, crazy. I think it's called like the bull or like translated to the bull or something like okay. that. Um, a total must watch. And maybe I totally ruined it for you but it's like when you <laughs> and to when everyone you, else listening and yeah, watching when you get this opportunity to debate this person or or mm-hmm. confront that thing and then they don't play the game yes. that you thought they don't allow the justice to be served in the way and then you kind of question whether even if they could allow you to serve justice would that do anything in the first place yeah, you know, it's, it's it. That's what I was thinking when you were explaining the 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 debate tactic. Yes. Now I do have a solution for how to debate folks like this. It is always remain kind and courteous and polite and calm, and begin what in my I have lecture series on this on YouTube called "Arguing to Convince." You choose them as your teammate in a slow, gentle exploration, a walk to the truth. Neither one of you hold the truth close to you. No one, no human can hold the truth. The truth is out there among us somewhere. And you go, hey, let's me and you team up and get closer to truth. And they go, okay. And as you walk, you go, okay, what do you think about this? Like, how should we train Joel Seidman? And he goes, he gives me his ideas. And you go, dude, that sounds like a lot of really good shit. Now, I have heard people saying that, like, there's tons of research that shows, like, going all the way down a squat's actually healthy for your knees. What, what do you think about that? And that's where they get into real deep shit because do your thing, bro. Tell me how you're right. And they can't. They go, well, yeah, because automatically they're like, oh, f- this guy has a PhD and he knows the research better than me. I don't know about these studies because obviously if he did, he would not believe these things, I think. And then starts the bullshit spiral of, well, no, yeah, that's a good point. But sort sort of kind of what I've seen is guys get hurt and they go, okay, I gotcha. So maybe it's like these guys kind of were hurt before. And then for them, we have to be more ginger. But if people are healthy, do you think like kind of maybe you agree with the studies that like actually deep knee bends are maybe pretty good? And they go, yeah, no, I can see that. And all of a sudden with the, I can see that his jettisoned his whole philosophy and everyone who's watching the debate goes, oh, but I thought this guy said uh, squatting deep was bad. Now he's saying it's good. This guy doesn't even think anything. He's just a bullshit artist and you got him if you walk with someone towards the truth openly gently together you bring them along you say come on let's go learn stuff let's go figure stuff out if you walk with them and do that you're not in a place of animosity anymore and you're not generating any resistance you're not even pulling them you're like come on come on i'm over here let's go the truth is this way and if they go well but uh, 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 they seem like they're impeding the walk to the truth and then the comments look different they're like why wouldn't joel just agree with mike on that point or oh joel agreed with mike on that point he just dunked his whole philosophy because that contradicts his earlier and then you could even gently be like so you so you're saying that, that actually deep squats are okay in most contexts and he goes well yeah it tons actually this is what he said on the podcast with mark bell he's like well yeah, like for 80 percent of my shit, i just do conventional normal lifting it's just like the 20 percent or whatever that i put on my instagram and then i i say something effective like well you know i i really appreciate that it's really actually good to know so like this kind of kind of more exotic stuff you don't even typically do it a ton right he's like no i don't like mostly it's just like hardcore full rom all this i was like i i got you man that sounds good 
And that's all I have to say. Because everyone who sees that goes to his page and sees exclusively only free. He's a liar by omission. F him. Yeah. He's just an Instagram yep. clout chasing asshole. It's like, you know, it's like the f the big t that only puts the t's up. And like, how the f does the rest of you look? And she's like, another picture of my t and you're like, man, okay, <laughs> I know how the rest of it looks. You don't have to tell me. And so there is something completely clarifying and um, cleansing about just gently welcoming people to go walk towards the truth with you right. because only the things that are the best reasoned and best vetted survive that walk. I don't even care if they're my things. I would love it if on the way to the truth, Joel actually taught me that, yeah, in some context, this eccentric, isometric, 90 degree shift, really awesome he has all the time in the world to prove that to me mm. but now he has to go on the attack now he looks like he has an axe to grind and now he's trying to convince me of it and now i just have very polite questions that i know for a fact he can't answer and then it's a real bad time for him i love your answers on all of this we are Thank very so much, phil philosophically in tune dude I think. keep getting his fucking charlatans bro and if you have all oh, charlatans that you know about DM me about up and coming mm -hmm. major charlatans that have large yep. followings. And we, I there's a decent one. chance we'll just, cook them I, on the exercise scientist uh, show on our YouTube. Who did you, who did you just do? Uh, let's see here. Oh, you got a list. Dude. This guy's for real. Dude. Well, it's, um, uh, you know what? I'll send it to you, but it was basically just another person doing like crazy exercises, like yeah. seemingly dangerous. Um, and then, the the main thing was weaponized specificity yes it's like that that is typically the biggest one that you're going to see yes is like when yeah yeah when specificity yeah. is the only principle of training you know but there's like seven others but you forgot yeah, well, that they it, exist. maybe it's not like maybe in practice you're not actually being specific but in argument in debate this sure. is the reason why because it transfers or or like yes. there's no way a deadlift transfers and you're like okay right. well we're not looking for your version of transfer, right? We're trying yeah. to, it's just, I, whatever. I'm not going to, anyways. Um, Mike, I appreciate this, man. We're going to do it again at some point. Um, and we'll get some some more fodder for the, I love it. the psychos on YouTube. Appreciate you coming by, man. Dude, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.